Welcome to the Take 92 Podcast. My name is Sammy Warmhands. I am your host. And today I've got a living legend, punk rock pioneer, Jello Biafra. Formerly of the Dead Kennedys, Jello's current band, Jello Biafra and the Guantanamo School of Medicine, is still dropping gems. They just released a new album called Tea Party Revenge Porn. And we're going to talk a bit about that, as well as share a new song from it at the end of the show. This is Jello Biafra. Appreciate you uh, jumping on the show. Yeah. Are you in a good place? I'm in Eugene, Oregon. Oh, okay. All right. Ironically, I uh, was looking at an old, early, like circa 83, maybe hardcore album from New Jersey called Public Disturbance. And inside it was a bunch of pieces of paper. I wonder what it was. And I pulled it out. And it was a Xerox of an article from the Eugene Register Guard. Wow. I don't know, 83, 84, somewhere in there. That's so random. I got in there. I don't know. Was that just today? Yeah, yeah, last night. That's funny. Yeah, they, uh, they actually just put out an article in the other paper, the Eugene Weekly, yesterday, I think, about the the punk rock scene in the 90s, I was like, that is the cover story? I kind of couldn't believe it. Huh. Who did they feature? You know, it was local bands. There were some flyers that, you know, you'd have like Black Flag and other bands come through that were actually known, but for the most part, it was like either the bands that I grew up opening for or the ones kind of just the generation before me, because I'm like 35, huh. so I started doing it kind of late 90s. Hmm. I, uh, I had... Dominic and Kate on the show last year from uh, Tsunami Bomb and uh, Winston before that. I've been really lucky to uh, kind of become a friend of his. He's a great dude. Winston did the last two album covers for my band. And um, actually, he told me we're called Dead Fucking Serious. He asked for extra copies so we could give them to you. I don't know if he if he did, but it was some time ago. He was like, yeah, I think he'd really like this uh, cover that I did. It was called Squalor, the first one. Boy, I'm not recalling these, although I haven't been to his place in a while. Yeah, so that was a couple years you back. You might want to send pictures of these album covers to Dominic to forward to me or something. I'll know immediately if I have them or not, if I see them. Yeah, I'll forward them along. The, the last one he did was called Peril, and it was all um, like shell casings at the backdrop. The lettering was made out of guns. Kind of like he did the the revamped Idol. Huh. It was pretty cool, but yeah. That, it it looks kind of like gold pipes in the middle. It's all gold, like, bullet casings and stuff in a pile. I didn't know it was bullet casings. I think I may have that. Uh, that's actually the one of the only ones I ever bought the original, so I have the, the actual original hand on my wall. Wow. Yeah, those are not easy to come by these days. I have a great one where he just altered a Holiday Inn painting and put all this cool shit in it. (laughs) Really? He decided he didn't like it and just handed it to me. (laughs) That's awesome. It may still be an album cover someday. It's a real good one. Anyway, all right, here we go. All right. I wanted to begin just by saying I was first introduced to your music in a very strange place, and that was probably a lot of people my age. The intro from Ixnay on the Ombre. Ah. I got into you from The Offspring, and I got into Winston from Green Day, like right back to back. It's kind of funny. Well, you got to find your gateway drug somewhere. Exactly. People can hurl epithets of both those bands all they want, but they got where they are because there's they've got talent. Absolutely, yeah, and they they, and, they do what they uh, want to do. The reason that I mean, Offspring was a little more right place at the right time because you know Dexter admits you know they owe about just about all their whole sound to TSOL and the early you know beach punk bands, and they just happened to be the one when people finally discovered that sound. They even used Tom Wilson. I mean, they were they were all about right. TSOL <laughs> and that early shit, especially. Yeah, that bought him a house on a mountaintop in south of Santa Cruz. Meanwhile, Jack's still touring in a van like mine. <laughs> I remember uh-huh. we got to uh, play with them, uh, I don't know, maybe two years ago, and 
they still just absolutely tore the house down. It was great. Yeah, I don't know how much I'll see them now. I mean, they went on tour with the fake dead Kennedys. So. Oh, really? Yeah. That'll that change things. Me. I, I remember, man, when I was in like high school and uh, one of my friends begged me to borrow my plastic surgery disasters. And it was like one of my favorite CDs. And then he lost it. I made him buy me a new copy. And he gave it to me, and I'm like, wait, what is this? What is Manifesto? <laughs> and, like, that was how I learned about all that shit. Was, yeah, uh, I don't back the Manifesto stuff at all. Yeah, I learned that pretty quickly because I... I have yet to sign a single copy because I don't consider it legit. Yeah, they're bootlegs, basically. Wouldn't authorized by me. Yeah, so as I mentioned, um, you know, lucky enough to uh, work with Winston a bit... And when he was on the show, he told me that you guys met uh, after trading postcards and that as you were going through his portfolio that he brought to share, that he said right away one of the first things that caught your eye was Idol that became In God We Trust Incorporated. Do you remember that in a similar way? No. <laughs> um the postcards, yeah, I actually found it the other day. The one he sent me where he mentioned a mutual friend said, you and I might, might dig each other if you want more right back. And it wasn't even a collage. It was a really, really high contrast, almost indecipherable color Xerox of John F. Kennedy's head exploding. Oh, my God. It was a Bruder film. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, send me more. And then he sends me this big packet of collages and a self-portrait slash promo photo of him with a gas mask on standing in the middle of all those graves in the military cemetery in Colma. And there was a little box of Three Mile Island detergent and there was <laughs> uh, a Vice card and a Master Scam card, the parody Visa and MasterCard. And so we just kind of drew closer and closer together and then became partners in art crime. I didn't know about the In God We Trust piece until I went to a then rare gallery show of his in Berkeley. And there were several sculptures in addition to uh, collage art. There was a couple of different ones where he'd gotten parakeet cages, and one of them had cat litter across the bottom, and then a Jesus in there, and then all these little doll hands coming up out of the cat litter. Then there was, of course, the bowling trophy Jesus on a cross made out of dollar bills, <laughs> and I dug it so much, I thought, yeah, we should even make a record based on this and uh then reagan got in and jerry falwell started acting like he was reagan's boss and you were all gonna pray to his god in school and you know there was everything's gonna be nice and segregated again and i wasn't very happy about that so uh thus the gut rage and the music and the in God We Trust Incorporated, where we got the fascinated old ladies pointing out the car window with the Klan rally on the back. I love that shot. I mean, there's a kind of, you know, I've done all my art direction, all the stuff I've ever put out, and it helps to know a lot of cool artists, and I don't think a single one has ever declined being on one of my album covers. You know, just Sandow Burke and Shepard Ferry and Mackie Osborne did the first of the ones I did with the Jelvins. And then um, Camille Rose Garcia did an original painting for the second one. Buzz had pointed me towards her. I talked to uh, Winston about that Giger piece that you used for Frankenchrist. I was too young at the time, but I remember as I was digging into your, your work and, and discovering that you were kind of like the PMRC's poster child for obscenity i mean they really wanted to make an example out of you and I, I dug up all the old interviews and stuff of you on like oprah and stuff with ice tea and, and the one where i caught her lying on live national television <laughs> yes yes with tipper gore and everything and and oh man yeah, that was the second time i was on with tipper gore the first time Oprah would barely let me talk. And she had a little hand gesture that's just out of the camera frame where she kind of uh, points with her entire hand 
toward whose mic should be on, who gets the floor, who gets the camera on them ah. and stuff. And so the next time I showed up prepared and she kept trying to point and point and get them to cut me off. And I wouldn't stop talking because I knew I had one chance and that was going to be it. And then she was never going to let me talk again Yeah, because I'm not sure she realized she was putting that guy on the show again. And I told her longtime producer, oh, Ms. Hudson, I can't remember her last name, uh, Harpo Productions Haunt Show, that don't you remember who I am? Uh, oh, well, that's okay. <laughs> I was wondering, like, who thought it was a good idea? And granted, this is before a lot of your spoken word stuff, but I mean, who thought it was a good idea to engage in a televised debate with you on national tv <laughs> like i i just couldn't believe that they were gonna try to oh yeah we'll show them we're gonna bring our case to the public and let them decide like you weren't gonna come like didn't at one point you actually pulled out the newspaper and like no you said this about me don't deny it now yeah she denied saying and i had that newspaper in my pocket because i knew she was going to deny it <laughs> and i pulled it out and there she you know i think didn't i even say you know what are your own kids going to think of you seeing you lying on that show television what kind of an example are you setting and she also on there was a uh, R Rabbi Abraham Cooper from the Wiesenthal Center. And when I linked Tipper to anti-Semitic religious fanatics, he suddenly stopped saying that he wanted Guns N' Roses censored and stuff. <laughs> so, uh, and I actually left a message at Alternative Tentacles, but I didn't call him back. I probably should have. But uh, I, I think I got through that. Look, Tipper is just fronting for all kinds of serious fucking hate groups. What you know, the point of endorsing a group in her book called the Back and Control Center, which were formed by a couple of L.A. ex-L.A. cops to uh, direct parents whose children had fallen under the spell of punk and heavy metal to various uh, institutions like that Provo Canyon School that Paris Hilton is now trying to get shut down, and for good reason, and others like that that were more brutal than that one was. And I think she charged they were drugging people there, which I had not heard from uh, two or three other refugees of that place I've interviewed. I've interviewed three, actually. That May All Your Dreams Be Wonderful track on No More Cocoons, the first uh, spoken word album, is about both back in control and kid getting thrown into Provo Canyon. And nobody sued over because they had my facts straight and stuff. But in the back and control manual, how to find out if your child is worshiping the devil or is under the spell of evil music, among the things in there as, as an occult symbol was the Star of David. Wow. And when I tipped a heavy metal journalist to that, it turned out she was Jewish Defense League and also a very difficult person to get off the phone and stuff. And so, you know, she, she actually looked like a metal chick version of Ann Coulter or something, but <laughs> completely the opposite side of the fence on yeah. how she felt about things. And she just went ballistic over them. And she had her ways of getting, like, police files on people and getting home phone numbers of Tipper's colleagues and the PMRC and calling them up to argue with them. And uh, that was a great force to unleash on them for sure. Yeah, that's pretty great because I mean, the well, fact she that was they on a first name basis with Rabbi Cooper as well, and the, just the fact that they went so hard on you. I mean, aside from like, you know, Lenny Bruce and George Carlin, and even those guys, I don't think their homes were raided by the cops, and you know, dive through everything that they own to try to find proof of obscenity to kids matter that was their term for it it was a law that had never even been used before distribution of harmful matter to minors and they busted people all along the distribution chain except the retail store because it was a chain store and you know one teenage girl had gotten frankenchrist for christmas or something from somebody else and her father was this creepy kind of dude who looked a little like the singer for the Eagles of Death Metal, Jesse Hughes, only he had a full handlebar mustache <laughs> and stuff. And apparently he was a crackpot preacher. 
or at least a religious fanatic based on how he was talking to people. And prosecuting attorney Michael Guarino, he even said straight out on a press conference in his office, we believe this is a cost-effective way of sending a message. Man. And then Don Bowles, who's had quite an interesting life over the years, from playing drums in The Germs and 45 Grave to writing for the LA Weekly for a while and somehow ingratiating himself later with Michael Guarino, who actually was during the case going on, where he admitted he had a file of better-known musicians that they were going to go after as soon as they got their conviction on me. And then we start reminiscing about the acid trips he took in college and stuff like that. And Guarino later called in to a national public radio show I was on. They'd arranged to tell me and apologized for the whole thing. Really? They fought like crazy to keep the lyrics from getting admitted into evidence for the jury so they could see them. And then he fessed up later. Once we lost that battle and knew the lyrics were coming in, we knew we were going to lose the case. That's pretty incredible. Because no redeeming social value versus thematic content. Yeah, social commentary. The only reason I like that Giger picture so much, which is not called Penis Landscape, it was actually called Landscape Roman Numeral 20, Where Are We Going? That was Giger's name for it. Yeah. And basically when I saw that, when a roommate showed me that as a feature on Giger's work in a magazine, I'd never seen his work before, and I was just totally blown away. It was the best art I'd seen since Euronymous Bosch. Best painted art. I mean, collage wise, you got Winston Smith, you got G from Crafts, and Winston looks to John Hartfield, who was decades earlier. Anyway, but for the you know painters, whatnot, Giger's kind of it for me as far as modern artists go. Yeah, when I saw that. I was just totally blown away. And you know what good art is? It's art that provokes. It provokes thoughts. It's inspiring. Your brain starts spinning. Ideas start popping into your head that wouldn't pop into your head. Otherwise, you know, I can get that from listening to a cool piece of music that I'd never heard before and stuff. You know, some record I find in the thrift store, not knowing what it is, put it on. Oh, my God, this is good. And then another piece of music will pop into my head and suddenly I've got a great song of my own and stuff. You know, I call it brain spin. And when I saw Landscape Number 20, I was like, my God, this is Reagan America right here. This is it. This is the fucking album cover. So I changed the word here, changed the word there, because, you know, that Giger painting was what made me think, oh, my God, a lot of these songs will tie together. And we it's all, almost an accidental concept album. And so very, very important piece. And originally I wanted it to be the outside cover, and then you open it up, and you get the Shriner Parade. Yeah. And with no explanation, no writing anywhere, <laughs> and uh, to our distributor wasn't into that saying no retail store would stock it. And we looked into uh, solid color shrink wrap like Roxy Music and Pink Floyd had used, but it was way too expensive. And the other guys in the band, after the fact, after we got the rights from Giger, which I was just astonished we did, then they freaked out and didn't like it anymore. And for all kinds of lame reasons, it kind of boiled up in different people for different reasons. So then instead it became a poster inside. It wasn't even a gatefold opening up to that. It was, it was the poster we all know and love. And I thought the country was more mature than to actually try and say that's obscene. Let's throw the guy in jail. I mean, they didn't really want to throw me in jail. They just wanted to get the conviction and then go after Prince and Judas Priest and Black Ozzy Osbourne and the rest of them. Yeah, I think that's interesting Political that they were setting a precedent with you. And rap music didn't hit for another year or two. And that was when Tipper and crew started playing the race card. Once mm -hmm. they played the race card, the whole issue got hot again. You know, the stuff that was coming out from NWA and Ice-T and Public Enemy. And the guy with the horns could only scare suburban moms so much. <laughs> yeah. But their precious children listening to angry lyrics by black people documenting what it was like to be a black person in the ghetto next door. We cannot have that. And Tipper, who to this day has successfully passed herself off as a liberal feminist, it was a race card to the core. 
Well, and that was around the same time, speaking of Ice-T, that he featured you on his uh, Shut Up and Be Happy on the Freedom of Speech record, uh, the, or the Iceberg record. Uh, what was the origin of that? I don't think we even met until the green room right before the Oprah. Oh, really? Taping. Yeah. Yeah, that was the first time we ever met. And his record was already out by then. Um, he apparently heard it mixed by a DJ who happened to know me because he was the drummer in Grong Grong, an old alternative tentacles band from Australia that ended way too soon when the singer OD'd and stuff. He survived, but he was kind of wrecked by it and stuff. But anyway, so he was this techno DJ. And he put like instrumental electronic music on one turntable and something like that on the other and mix them. And Ice happened to be in the club and wondered what the hell it was and found out and then just put it on there. And their A&R guy, it's Sire, who'd signed Ice to the label in the first place, Howie Klein, was from San Francisco. He was the guy who started 415 Records before that, you know, that got Romeo Void and Red Rockers and Translator and whatnot. And a lot of the punks just hated him as being this kind of more commercial guy who didn't give us the time of day and this, that, and the other. But I kind of always got along with him. So he knew how to find me. And there he was at Sire and said, Jello, we got to discuss something. This record's about to come out. And uh, you're not just sampled for five seconds, you're sampled for yeah. five minutes. Yeah, you're the whole and intro. We need to get the clearance and figure out how to pay you. And so I had to call Ice T's guy. Little did I know he was a high flying Hollywood lawyer and stuff, and negotiated a little few pennies per record, which my guy said that's about all you're going to get anyway in a situation like that, but it'll add up. And he offered me a flat rate of five grand. I settled for like, I think a penny and a half a record or something and ultimately got about double that, which financed the Tumor Circus album. So well, that's good. it was a win-win all the way around. I mean, I financed my Tumor Circus album and got to be friends with Ice-T. So, uh, yeah, and, can't and be mad once, at that. Even, you know, I got in a weird situation and I don't know, not really wrong part of town, but some... Uh, african-american teenagers were kind of cornering me and i don't know what was going on what was going to happen and they recognized my voice <laughs> and then decided i was cool that's amazing yeah thank god yeah. for that signature tone yeah i'd get rid of it if i could but it's what i got so i might as well use it as a weapon would you though you know, i even, mean even in high school it's like ew it's weird voice but then i realized after hearing people like peter ivers and sparks and others that a weird voice is actually a good thing to have if you know how to use it either just to get other people's skin for the sake of getting other people's skin or turn it into something because about all the thing you're good for is singing and you want to be in a band. The best thing you can have, even if you've only got a two note range is the minute you open your mouth, people know it's you. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's why I was so surprised I kinda, that you want to change it. owned my alleged skills accordingly. There's no substitute for originality, you know? Well, this is kind of accidental originality. Well, yeah, but again, just kind of owning that. And it's not like you couldn't have come out and tried to do what other people did. You know, you're still being fully yourself and going wild and doing things that other people aren't doing on records, you know. Yeah, it's not easy, man. I just got back from the voice coach I've had since 1985. I finally broke down and went to a vocal teacher to see if I would could, could not blow out after two gigs on a Dead Kennedys tour, and sure enough, it worked. And, you know, I got a lot of my old range back and stuff, too, through her, and I got to get my throat back in gear because uh, Sunday, rain or shine, I got to record my part for the new Ministry album. Oh, nice. There's a really, really cool you know, one of the best and most emotional things I've heard out of Al in years that closes this album. And it's very much in tune with the times and everything. And the first heavy part 
is Al singing and kind of get the party started. And then the middle is a little more ambient where uh, DJ Arabian Prince, you know, one of the co-founders of NWA, yeah. who's buddies with Al now, he reads some of John Lewis's words from the uh, thing the New York Times published uh, that was meant to be published on the day of John Lewis's memorial. Mm-hmm. And then it goes back to faster ministry metal and showtime. I have to follow fucking John Lewis, <laughs> but I'll do the best I can. Probably never thought you'd be doing that. No, but weirder things have happened. I mean, it's also, I guess you could call this a collaboration. There's a, an extended sample of Edward Snowden. Oh, really? Talking about corporate media in the middle of where I'm supposed to be. And I may wind up on top of him and will have to move or delete Snowden. I don't know. But it might, he may be able to stay on how I'm timing it. I mean, I had to write the lyrics, too. So um, hopefully it'll all work out. That's cool that you guys are still working together. I mean, I know that we just had the 30th anniversary of the Lard LP. I mean, that's that's pretty great. God, I'm, we could have hyped it that way. I didn't even think of that. And are you talking about Power of Lard or Last Temptation of Reed? Last Temptation. Wow. God. Yeah, I saw a couple people we post about it. We could have made chocolate Easter bunny reproductions of Reed and then sold them so people could bite Reed's head off all over the world. <laughs> well, hey, I mean, Winston's been selling those Insomniac Reed prints. one off on camera or we wouldn't pay him and stuff. <laughs> Oh, my God. I wish I'd thought of that. I mean, my erstwhile estranged ex-bandmates are flogging the 40th anniversary of Dick Kennedy's, then Ray with the mathematics degree to realize, oh, my God, now it's 42 years. What are, oh, 40th anniversary of Fresh Fruit. There you and go. we'll even go behind Jello's back and hire some big Hollywood guy out of the movie industry to remix the album. Really? Yeah, yeah, the first teaser is already up online. Jesus. I think it's even on YouTube, A Chemical Warfare. And I'm not very happy that they won't even tell me how much of what would ultimately be my money is getting spent on this. It's a guy named Chris Lord Algae who's out of the film industry and stuff. Oh, I yeah. I guess he has a Green Day credit or two, but uh, oh, he's, overall, I was like, he's oh, yeah, huge. he's all the music for Batman and whatnot. How much does somebody like that cost even to get him to talk to you on the phone? Oh, Chris you Lord Algae is... Him. When you hear the thing, to my ears, it's not a remix. It's somebody recording straight off an original Cherry Red copy of the LP from England. They rushed out and mastered it wrong speed and the wrong settings. So there's no bot man at all. It's all like this. You have to all on helium. <laughs> and there we are on helium once again, only put through fucking auto tune or something. Oh God. That is not a remix. I'm sorry. And this man is oh yeah, we have the original sixteen track, blah blah blah. <laughs> It's not a 16 track, and I know where the tape is. Maybe some people like it, but buyer beware. If they think there's going to be some big financial windfall after this, and who knows how much money on this. I mean, when was the last time a remix of an album a lot of the fans think of as a classic ever been some big bonanza to get people to buy the album again? They've remixed Let It Be by the Beatles twice. Yeah. Gee, you didn't know that, did you? No, I didn't. Yeah, that shows how many people rushed out and bought that. <laughs> I mean, there's a remix of Raw Power, too, that Iggy did in the late 90s. And I didn't even find out it existed till I found a vinyl copy in a bargain bin like three or four years ago. Yeah, and I'll tell you, I've had other producers on the show, and they've got... Chris Lord Algae mixing their record and they implied how much money that does cost and it is a lot. That is the major label's favorite mixer in, in rock music the last few years. Oh God, all the more we avoid him like to play. <laughs> and again, after hearing this alleged remix of Chemical Warfare, I'm not only shocked that Ray and Klaus 
would put their name on that. I'm more shocked that Chris Lord Algae would. Well, enough of Kennedy's. I think the stuff you're doing now Don't is... Don't get me wrong. I'm really proud of all that stuff. I mean, I hope most of the music, too, it means a lot to me. And I think it means more to me than any of those other guys. I was getting into your spoken word stuff like 20 years ago, and I remembered hearing you say that you had filled a notebook with George W. Bush quotes. I thought that was so great because I actually had a daily calendar of George W. Bush quotes at that time. <laughs> of just oh, like... I never kept a notebook of them. I just kept a few. The notebook was who I compared him to, oh. which was a very unusual geometry teacher I had. And he talked like the people in the Fargo movie. And slowly but surely, he went on. He had a, you know, he wore baggy, like, 50s clothes and stuff in the 1970s, little skinny black tie, sometimes a flannel hunting shirt over it, or this coat with little wings on the end, and a disproportionately small head for his body, and a turtly face, and wavy widow's peak hair, and you know, he was odd enough already, enchantingly and endearingly so, and then one fine day, now we're talking about the anger, C-A-B-E, excuse me, B, anger, <laughs> A-D-W-E, boy, am I having a time today. And then it grew and grew and grew. And me and another friend in the earlier class period began writing his quotes down. And has a notebook to this day. You even did your Bush parody with Cage and DJ Shadow on that kind of anti-war track that they had. You're doing it. They got missiles and weapons and <laughs> you're doing your whole bit I between the verses. I think they must have sampled it off of one of the spoken word albums. I don't recall. You know, I didn't go into the studio. Oh, really? To cut something especially for Cage. I mean, we had the same booking agent at that point. Interesting. But I don't recall doing anything specifically for him. Weird. She probably got it off of one of the albums. Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. I never even uh, considered that it could have been like the Ice-T situation where they just ripped it from the record. Yeah, only this time nobody could really consult at me. It might not be a very long sample anyway, so who cares? But I didn't realize DJ Shadow was part of that too. That's cool. What was that like at that time when you were touring the spoken word stuff as like a middle on that Rock Against Bush tour? Because that was... That was the only time I've seen you live in person. and Oh, my God. I remember yeah. it was so weird, though. They'd have whatever opening bands, and then you would go out there, and I was thrilled. I, you know, I couldn't wait. And then I'd get all these drunk people in the audience, like, bring the no effects on, or yelling shit, you know, just being horrible while you're trying to do your thing. Like, was that harder to do in that environment than when it's your own tour? In a lot of ways, but somebody needed to offer actual political content on the Rock Against Bush tour. Yeah. So Fat Mike wanted me to come along on that, and I did. And good time was had by all, and I'm glad I did it and got through to some people. I mean, I caught shit from the more radical than thou for hooking up with Fat Mike in the first place. You know, what are you doing collaborating with that dude? His reputation before Punk Voter and Rock Against Bush was, of course, just party animal for party animal's sake, and that was their whole band. Yeah. Well, a sophisticated, wicked sense of humor. we got to give him credit there. Plus, their particular strain of pop punk seems to be the one that is most copied by other pop punk bands. Yeah, definitely. anybody. And then a lot of people slang for them was frat records instead of fat records. <laughs> you know, he knew how to identify other bands who would sell to his audience and, you know, has done very, very well for himself. Anyway, so I just thought, you know, this is a cool project. There's strength in numbers. I could do this on my own and preach to a smaller choir, or I could do this. And some things needed to be brought into Punk Voter anyway. Number one, a Green Party perspective, because they were all about get Bush out, even if the nominee is John Kerry and stuff. Yeah. We all know where that went at the end of the day. 
I mean, Mike was a Howard Dean guy, and I was like, you need the greens in here, too. And I got another green to come in with me, Jesse Luscious from uh, Criminals on the Frisk, and he worked at AT for years as well. And at one point was a national director for the Green Party, I do believe. But anyway, so uh, there was that. And also trying to emphasize to people, and I can't remember if I did this on the stage, but surely I did, that these elections are not all about who's president. Yeah. The local offices are where the action really is. And the ballot initiatives, because so few people pay attention to those, that when people like us show up and vote in large enough numbers, we actually get somewhere. And you guys it registered a lot of people. Who the state legislature is. It matters who the mayors are. It matters who the sheriff is. It matters who the school board is, especially to the religious right, we're constantly trying to take them over. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, you know what happened in uh, Oregon years ago with uh, measure whatever it was that that guy Lon Maybon got on the statewide ballot to discriminate against the LGBTQ community, as they are called now. And luckily, there was finally enough backlash and alerts that Oregon voted it down. Unlike Colorado, Oregon voted it down. I'm sure Portland and Eugene and maybe Corvallis would have voted at Ashland or whatever, would have voted it out down anyway. But there was all the rest of Oregon, including all the parts of Portland across the river that give us all the racial incidents and Tanya Harding and skinheads and you name it and stuff. So, And it's all Trump country now. But the word got out. I mean, the only time I ever saw Nirvana was when – they played a great big outdoor show at a horse racing track against that amendment. And they hadn't played in months and months and months and stuff. They were working on in utero and, you know, badly needed a break. And everybody was already starting to worry about Kurt. But they played Helmet Play, Poison Idea played. Um, and I can't remember. There was another one or two of them that played, too. And. I was either the MC or did an extended little speaking thing. Somebody had even made a Lon Maybon soccer ball and was kicking it all over the grounds of the racetrack and stuff. That was pretty amusing. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it was a little hard to get it to bounce right because he had a nose and he had ears. You know, it was latex and stuff kind of in a ball. You were just featured briefly in that Art of Protest documentary. and <laughs> They had that... Trump head that they were playing soccer with, and I think Putin had one, and I forget what else, but uh, I just saw that because Winston had posted it, and uh, I, I really enjoyed that, Doc, speaking of you and him and Fat Mike and the guy, I forget who else was in it, Anti-Flag and Tom Morello, I think. Did God, you? I do so many interviews, I don't remember being interviewed for this at all. Rolling Stone just released it on their site. It was from, I think, huh. In Decline. Wow. Maybe they used something that you had been interviewed for something else. I don't know. Well, I have a vague memory that Winston was trying, somebody who interviewed Winston was trying to get to me or Winston tried to get me to go to them, which happens every once in a while anyway. And obviously this was on camera because I don't do camera interviews anymore except on Zoom. Yeah. Because of this lovely, you know, it's not the Chinese virus. It's the Trumpsy plague. Seriously. I call them Trump Z's, T R U M P Z I S. Might as well call them what they are. Yeah. I, I mean, I, you don't just follow along with corporate McNews who suddenly decide that, you know, in order to get the corporations more power than they already have and lower their taxes so they can loot the store, we've got to quit calling these people what they are. They're not neo Nazis anymore, they're the alt right. Uh, Sorry, there's still a bunch of fucking Nazis. <laughs> Yeah, it's branding, it's spin. I mean, I still kind of can't believe that, you know, everything from that we were seeing in 2016 that everyone, even the commentators on TV were saying is the most absurd, this isn't going to go anywhere, this shit is crazy, and now it's so normalized that any rational thought is like no extremist. no amount of help from corporate cartoon McNews. Absolutely, because they want those Even views. The supposed lefty ones like MSNBC, it's all Trump all the time. Yeah, it gets that ratings. You don't even hear about the kids in the cages still there. You know, nervous breakdown a day with no schooling or no love or no hugs. There's still 
hundreds, if not thousands of them down there. I really fear when that's finally torn open, if somebody like Biden even bothers, if he gets in, you know, we may find mass graves. You know, and you do a little bit of DNA and you find the sperm of Stephen Miller and Don Jr. all over him, you know, and Jared Kushner, too. Yeah, I mean, the secrecy of those places is um, troubling, to well, say the not least. it's a secret. It's right there. But the you fact that the media... You outside of them any time. I mean, your Senator Wyden, I think, was the one who went down there, wasn't it? Yep. Has he been back since? Has anybody been back? And even if he was, would anybody even put it on the air right now? Probably not. I mean, instead, it's like the horse race. It's like they're covering it like pro wrestling or a sports cast. Who raised more money? As if that's a measure of how decent a human being is, <laughs> and whether they belong in any of these public offices. Who raised more money this week? I mean, this is nuts how they do it by design as the veneer of democracy further and further melts away is you get people to accept it after a while. You know, we've almost accepted masks as a new normal, Yeah, which scares me a lot because there may be another COVID next year. You know, this thing may mutate and mutate and maybe you finally do get a real vaccine, but it's mutated again, yeah. just like other flus and viruses do. I mean, scientists are really worried about that. and I can't say I blame them. Yeah. And there's a song on the new album, the Jello Biafra from the Guantanamo School of Medicine album, my current band. Uh, the album is called Tea Party Revenge Porn. Fantastic and title. the opening song that the video dropped for today, by the way, you can get it all on the Alternative Tentacles YouTube channel, as well as all my rant casts that have replaced the spoken word shows, because I can't do four-hour spoken word shows and a band and get all the material together at the same time. But i got to keep my finger in that pie somehow, so there's... All these little rant casts of various lengths called What Would Jello Do? You know, I found a What Would Jesus Do shirt in a thrift store and knew it could come in handy someday if I just put a piece of masking tape over Jesus and wrote my own name and voila. <laughs> Both Satan's Comb Over and the Tea Party Revenge Porn song were written before the Trumpsies stole 2016. Really? The real vote fraud, of course, is all the people whose ballots were tossed or weren't allowed to vote at all. Who needs Putin when you've got the interstate cross-check program exposed by Greg Palast in both book form and articles and then a movie? He's used the same title, Best Democracy Money Can Buy. Yeah, I have the first book. And interstate cross-check program was put together by that right-wing extremist wunderkind in Kansas, Chris Kobach. Same guy who wrote the Show Me Your Papers law for immigrants and we could pull everybody over for driving while brown in Arizona and yeah. harass people and stuff before that law got thrown out. Anyway, Kobach got 29 states to opt in and give him their entire database of voters statewide. He had 29 states, combined them all together, and got his little computer going to flag familiar names, yep. matching names. And they told Palast under duress that, you know, they didn't want people to even know it existed and stuff. Oh, no, no, we check social security numbers. We check middle names. And he proved pretty decisively, no, they didn't. And the program was meant to flag names like Washington. Because 75% plus of people with the last name of Washington are African-American. Yep. And if your name is Jose Gonzalez, all 2,000 of you got your ballots tossed over 29 states because you must be the same person trying to vote twice. And did people know this had happened to them? No. Where were all the black people? They didn't vote for Hillary. I think they probably did show up and vote for Hillary. But now even Rachel Maddow on down, oh, they say, well, when Trump was elected in 2016, no. This is like saying, you know, the anti-abortion fanatics are pro-life. Yeah. Or that vote fraud is all a handful of people with Spanish last names trying to vote twice when W used it to steal two elections and Trump stole the last one. And which they're using also, it now. By the way, means now with Amy Coney Barrett on there, and there's a five, five of the just nine justices were appointed by presidents who stole elections and lost the popular vote and shouldn't even be in, the, be in office. Yep. 
and they know too. They know they're all illegitimate. Well, and that's why Robert, they're rushing through Alito, the confirmation. Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, the rapist, and now Barrett, the fanatic who speaks in tongues and considers, you know, the minute the sperm comes out of the penis, if it isn't used to make a baby, you're guilty of murder. Yeah. That's what we've got now. I mean, these people are, they know that, like you said, and that's why they're rushing to confirm justices and doing all this shit while they oh, have yeah. the power so they it's can keep their grip. It's all part of an ongoing keep their grip. corporate coup that has been going, you know, a slow-moving tank with every little plank on the on a tread that it comes down, that's another part of the coup. So it's been very slow because otherwise people get upset. And every once in a while they step on the gas. 911, step on the gas. We got the Patriot Act through. And by the way, a senator accused John Ashcrack, the attorney general, of plagiarizing his own bill with the Patriot Act. And that senator was named Biden. <laughs> yeah. And um, they couldn't get away with running Biden unless it was Trump on the other side. But anyway, um, and then with Trump sees and everything, you step on the gas some more. Another opportunity. We can finally legitimize and with the Internet, they can network with each other. So we really can get all these racist and monster trucks pulling up to polling places with machine guns, scaring people away from voting. What I emphasize is people, you know, leave your liberal bubbles of Eugene or Portland Go to other parts of the state or even another state and be ready for vote defense, you know, like abortion clinic defense. Where yeah. When yeah. Those people with the bloody fetuses and stuff are yelling at people and heckling them and trying to scare them away from terminating a pregnancy. You know, clinic defense means escorting frightened women in to do what they need to do and exercise their legal right to control their own bodies and terminate a pregnancy. You know, you escort them in because they're so fucking scared otherwise. And already they've had to do this in the state of Virginia where one of these groups of monster truck Nazis with a great big Trump 2020 flags and stuff, which is exhibit A, that they're networking with the Trump campaign from day one. Anyway, they were having their bully parade down the street in this town of Virginia, and early voting began. And so some of them broke off after their rally was over and pulled up to the polling place and got out of their trucks and started yelling at people and trying to bully them and claim they had the right to check their credentials to see if they were eligible to vote. And so people inside the polling place had to go outside escort these frightened old ladies in one by one and even the county head of elections had to go out and do it because they didn't have anybody else to do it that's what's known as vote defense and that's what people need to do all over the country is be ready so when those clowns show up show up yourself and escort people in and that militia shit is scary especially i mean out here like you were saying so much of oregon is, uh, you know, drinking the Kool-Aid, and we had these wildfires much like you guys did down there, but I know, what, what I'm happened really was... sorry about that. Back in my home state of Colorado, right near where my mother still lives and stuff, it just breaks my heart. Yeah. You know, I get so upset when I hear about them and know where they are and whatnot. It's like, oh my God, how much is going to be left five years from now? It was scary. I mean, we know multiple people who lost their homes. And what made it even crazier, though, was that you had these militia people stopping residents who were going back. They'd send someone to check on their home. You know, they're in a shelter and they're like, hey, can you go and see if anything's left? You know, and there's these people with AKs stopping every car that comes through that looks like they might be driving a Subaru or something and say, oh, we caught an arsonist, you know, oh, we caught some Antifa people going through people's property, you know, and it was scary. There's fucking well, photos going through people's property instead. Yeah, exactly. You know, that's what they're doing. Yeah, it's just like the, oh, they're going to steal the election while we steal the election. <laughs> yeah. So so back to, you know, that's the real vote fraud just co-opting another term and the other side just letting them get away with it. All right, pro-life, vote fraud, 
we're not wrecking the land. We're developing the land. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You got to call people on that. You know, when everybody says Trump was elected, no. The Trump regime seized power. That's accurate. Oh. George W. Bush stole two elections, and he knows it. And so does Roberts, and so does Alito who he put on the court, and people blame Ralph Nader for that because of 2000. I'm sorry. Ralph Nader couldn't have done half as much to damage the Gore campaign in 2000 as Gore did himself. <laughs> Not just by picking just about the worst running mate he possibly could have. I was thinking even before he chose anybody, now who is the worst person he could possibly pick? Feinstein. No, there's one who's even worse. <laughs> Lieberman. Two days later, he picked him. Yeah. And then, of course, Lieberman was actively helping Bush in Florida, too. You know, it was like, oh, no, 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 no. you got to count all these ballots that are just now showing up postmarked later. You know, not a postmark at all because they're from soldiers. You're disrespecting the military. Those were fake. He knew it. He waved him through so they could tilt it more to Bush. Plus, of course, Gore did no favors, bitching and moaning about dimply chads and old Jewish ladies in four counties in South Florida and completely ignoring all the African-Americans who weren't allowed to vote in North Florida. And Jesse Jackson was like, uh, Al, take a look at this stuff. And he wouldn't. And Greg Palast even had the evidence ahead of time on how they were going to steal the election and plan all these fake felony convictions on African-American voters, yep. which are dogging them to this day, and how what Catherine Harris did. And he had all that. CBS News didn't want it, and Gore didn't want it. Plus, they had it already in their back pocket to blame it on Ralph Nader if they lost, of course, and then became, you know, popular or whatever. Even my father believed it and stuff, and he, he voted for him. <laughs> but no, no, no. If you want to know who really cost Gore the election, besides Lieberman and his own dumb, arrogant corporate Democrat decisions, one after another, don't forget who his wife is. Yeah. Or was. Yeah, exactly. There was no youth vote for Al Gore. They knew what she'd been up to to try and destroy their culture. Yeah. It was like, oh, my God, we cannot have this bitch in the White House. No way. Now— we're here to talk about Guantanamo, so... All right, let, let's rewind back to the Satan's comb-over. Yes, Satan's yes. Satan's comb-over is not specifically about Trump. It's about the whole phenomenon, the effect. And the comb-over is worldwide. I mean, did it start in France with Jean-Marie Le Pen and the uh, National Front? Or did it start parallel or earlier with something that's much more parallel to the American militia movement, but they got a huge chunk of the parliament, that Greek party called the Golden Dawn, were running around beating up immigrants in neighborhoods and scaring them into leaving their own property and their own businesses and threatening to kill them. And just recently, the top three people or something, definitely the top dude, just got convicted of murder. Jesus. And... From the get-go, people realized that a lot of the members of the Golden Dawn were police officers. They were military officers. And up top were senior military officers who were young, gung-ho, hardcore fascists who joined the military when the military junta ran Greece. You know, because there was a coup in the late 60s supported by Nixon and whatnot that lasted until, you know, a lower general went too far and tried to take over Cyprus and lost a war with Turkey over that. And then the whole uh, junta fell. But some of the younger ones are still in the military, and the Golden Dawn was the way to bring back the junta, basically, only through the voting and stuff. And they got really popular really fast. And a friend of mine I went to visit on the island of Crete after uh, end of a GSM tour and whatnot, he said that a few days before, somebody had come into the office where he worked and just came up to him and said, Hi, I'm from the Golden Dawn. We know who you are. We know you've been protesting us. You do it again, we're going to come get you. Fuck. Yeah, that kind of stuff. 
That is what we're looking at with these neo-Nazis rebranded as the alt-right and what they would like to do. But Satan's come over, worldwide phenomenon. You get National Front in France, and the Le Pens have come in second in the vote for president, the runoff twice in a row. And then, right after that, what do you get? Alternative for Deutschland, that horrible neo-Nazi alternative for Germany party. And you got people like, what's it, Wilders and Holland, who claimed that one of his inspirations was dead Kennedys, which infuriates me. <laughs> and they said, no, 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 just the music. Okay, like, sure. God, why yeah. wasn't he listening to fucking, I don't know. It's like Tom Morello and the rest of them after Paul Ryan bragged <laughs> yeah. that, yeah, when I work out, I listen to Rage Against the Machine. And so Tom Morello could get the press to listen. And, no, no, stop, please. We had nothing to do with your agenda. We're the exact opposite. And poor Neil Young has had to go after Trump how many times now? Aerosmith has had to and others. I love that some guy is listening to records of basically a dude yelling at him the whole time, just saying, like, fuck you. And you're like, yeah, this is a great song. I love it. Well, unfortunately, there's been studies done, and it's a great counter to Tipper Gore and her right-wing extremist friends, but it's really discouraging for people like me, the songwriter and the lyricist, where Cal State Fullerton, among others, has done studies of uh, adolescents and teenagers on how much they pay attention to lyrics and their favorite music, and they barely pay attention to them at all. Yeah, I don't want to know that. <laughs> well, granted, <laughs> yeah. um, the kind of stuff I liked, starting with like what they now call 60s garage rock, when it was actually on the radio in the mid-60s, when my parents blundered into a rock and roll radio station when I was seven years old, second grade 1965, and then there was no stopping me. But even then, I really didn't much care for the lyrics. I love you, baby, baby, baby. God, this is stupid. And then I got angrier at it in high school when I realized all this teen love and romance stuff was all a great big lie as opposed to real life. And luckily, I thought, well, listen to the words, man. Bob Dylan. And uh, Phil Oaks, where I yeah. really did listen to the words and eventually covered Love Me, I'm a Liberal and whatnot. Really? But I didn't relate to the music. It didn't rock for me. Yeah. Except Subterranean, Homesick Blues, a few others. But uh, you know what I'm saying. I mean, I wasn't a Beatle guy either. You know, I wanted early Stones, Paul Revere and the Raiders, Music Machine, then Steppenwolf hit. Then eventually Zeppelin and Sabbath hit, and then there was a critic in the Denver Post, the big daily paper that we got on Sundays, who wrote capsule reviews of pop music records. You know, he said things like Paul Simon and the Bee Gees were the greatest composers of the 20th century, but he also had encyclopedic knowledge of music he didn't like. And so when he said Black Sabbath was almost as bad as the MC5, I went looking for the MC5 the next day <laughs> and quickly found back in the USA for 50 cents at a used record store. And that was pretty good rock and roll. Okay, this isn't as cool as Black Sabbath, but I like them. I think I'll pick up this other album. Oh, 25 cents. Kick out the jams. And life began to change. That's and awesome. the Stooges soon followed, and others. And but I, I was always into that side of things. I don't know how he got off of Satan's comb over with that. <laughs> but the point being, Trump isn't first, but it's going on all over the world. And why is it going on all over the world at the same time? Bolsonaro in Brazil, the coup in Bolivia, that bloodthirsty guy who's like a Salvadoran death squad dictator in the Philippines, you know, Duterte and stuff, who may have killed more people than Ferdinand Marcos did now. And we barely hear about it all over the world at once. Erdogan in Turkey, Netanyahu, who may never leave until he dies which Trump is kind of the gears are turning to his head on that one, too. You know, we both have comb over here. We won't leave, and we're, we're both total fucking fascists. Why not? But why all over the world? Why at once? You know, it seems like our, you know, beloved corporate overlords and 1% fanatic right-wing billionaires and stuff finally decided, okay, we've had enough of this Occupy shit. We've had enough of this yeah. Green Party and other people getting in and stuff, and Obama scared us, even though he really shouldn't have, considering how little he really 
tried in those areas, a genuine progressive change we hoped for, but we've had enough of this. We got to put the boot down all over the world. And then out of nowhere comes this wingnut egomaniac celebrity whose main love and life is firing people on TV every week. <laughs> the only way he's still make money because he's failed at all his businesses. He says he's running for president and people bury their head in their hands, roll their eyes. First poll comes out, he's leading all the Republicans. And then they ham and they haw and they howl and all that. But then under their breath, they're thinking, my God, what have we found here? We don't have to spend hundreds of millions of dollars running all these ads just to introduce our dude and get people to like him. And That's stuff. true. That's like true. Like you'd have to with Jeff Bush or Scott Walker or Ted Cruz or Chris Christie or whatever. This guy already has all these fans. He doesn't just have fans. He has a cult following. Yeah. We can get away with so much more in looting the store and dragging down every last thing that ain't glued to the floor than we ever thought possible. You know, we could laugh at how totally incompetent Trump is up at the top. And granted, he's so incompetent, he's giving away all their strategy for stealing the election ahead of time. <laughs> yeah, on the news. And coming right out and saying, we're going to steal the election, try and stop us. I mean, the W. Bush people, the Carl Roves and whatnot, they wouldn't say a word. They just go in there and pounce. Yeah. Like they did, especially in 2004, betting correctly that John Kerry was such a spineless, empty husk of a corporate Democrat, he wouldn't protest after they blatantly stole Ohio. And that vice president he picked, John Edwards, even later said that he lobbied Kerry to go fight and whatnot, but Kerry wouldn't do it. And only later, Kerry's, oh, yes, I believe that election was stolen. <laughs> well, why didn't you do anything at the time? Go to Ohio, go on the steps of the state capitol and refuse to leave until all the ballots are counted. That's what you do. I think the scariest thing about Trumpsies, as you said it, is that they have along with social media, convinced the most gullible, willfully ignorant people that somehow they're the only ones who have it all figured out. They're the only ones with the answers, and everyone else oh, no. are the liars. And they're so entrenched now that there's no dialogue. There's no convincing anybody of anything anymore. It's just anything that 45 says is the gospel, you know. Or people whose names are going to remain nameless, who say much worse and make Trump look moderate, you know, and gets people who are so dumb and so full of bile and zealotry, you know, they can say that the Sandy Hook massacre where all these people had their six and seven year old children machine gunned to death. Yeah. And the next thing you know, you've got these lunatics who follow a lunatic talk radio guy showing up at their front doors and won't get off their lawns, yelling at them day after day after day to confess that their kids are bound up in their basements and that Sandy Hook was a hoax. And hounding those kids who went through the high school massacre in Florida to admit they're all old 25-year-old actors who are just playing fictitious people, all to create a scenario that it's all a conspiracy to fake high school massacres so that there would be a more popular sentiment to take these clowns' guns away. I actually forgot about that crisis you know, actors anybody thing. anybody that stupid is too stupid to own a gun. I'm sorry. Well, that's a hell of a lot of them from what I can tell. Oh, yeah, there's more guns in this country than there are people. Yeah. But they're all owned by a very small minority of the population. And a lot of these people who ran out and bought automatic weapons at whatever, the sporting goods stores or even Walmart or whatever, they didn't want them. They just figured they'd better get one because they'll need them to defend people trying to take them away later if they get illegal. Yeah. You know, I wish we could get rid of the Second Amendment, but the toothpaste is out of the tube. <laughs> yeah, pretty but much. There has to be other ways to uh, dial some of this back. I mean, what I wish we could do is what Australia did 
after some clown with a machine gun went down to a mall in Tasmania yep. and mowed down 36 people. And this is in a country where even like two or three people killed by one person is considered a horrifying mass shooting. It happens so rarely. 36 people. They acted quick. And this is Australians, keep in mind. They banned all automatic weapons. And you could no longer possess one or repair one or anything. And they paid you to turn your guns in. They bought them back. Yeah, I remember and that. I think the worst mass shooting they've had in Australia since is three or four people. And it's very, very rare. And it succeeded. I mean, they even gave away tickets to a Barry Manilow concert to get people to turn in <laughs> their machine guns. To which a stand-up comedian friend I know down there who used to run a punk and a hardcore lay label too, he said, you know, the problem with that is now I can't keep my machine gun to go shoot Barry Manilow. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. He wasn't a gun guy anyway. I know very few gun people. I mean, there's one thing to be responsible for that shit, but anybody trying to mow down people in Portland and just waving them guns in the air and stuff, that was a test run for November 3rd as was those other gun nuts coming in from out of state, a lot of them, and taking over the Michigan State Capitol building while the legislature was in session. Yeah. They don't tell you that part. The legislature was in session. And an African-American woman who was a state legislator said, I feared for my life just trying to get into my building to go to work and do my job. Oh, absolutely. That's why we need vote defense, people. I don't even want to think about what the fuck's going to happen after, either after next week or after January with the inauguration. I don't, well, either, either whatever way, it is, it's not good news. Lose. And not just because Biden deep down is so right wing and so corporate and so antiquated in terms of how much he realizes needs to change and how it needs to be done. Harris is a little better, but she comes from the same San Francisco big city Democrat machine yeah. that gave us Feinstein and Gavin Newscomb and Nancy Pelosi, who was handpicked by Feinstein to fill that seat to make sure that the heir apparent to Harvey Milk, whose name was Harry Britt, didn't get the seat. They pick every single mayor in part because there was a federal law passed called the Raker Act way back when they made the exception to build a dam in Yosemite National Park. And the water would go to San Francisco, as would the electricity. And part of that law was that the electricity is publicly owned by the city. But, oh, the city ran out of money on the other side of the bay. This corporation called Pacific Gas and Electric, PG&E, just happened to have the money in the copper wire to put the electricity the rest of the way to San Francisco so they get to own it instead. And nobody has ever enforced the Raker Act on PG&E, huh. which means PG&E must always control who the mayor is, who the DA is, and keep in mind, Kamala Harris was DA for a while. Yep. And, of course, make sure that the governor ain't going to go at them either. And at this point, they've been so negligent and caused so many forest fires that have burned up so many thousands of houses and killed so many people. The time has come to seize pg e public domain. And to my shock, Newsom has actually threatened to do it. Wow. Although I think he's just blowing smoke. Well, I'll take even a hint of someone giving a fuck at this point. Yeah, but be warned for the future. Gavin Newsom is the Mitt Romney of the Democrats. <laughs> he claims he's this up from the bootstrap, self-made businessman with his chain of wine stores and stuff. But he grew up in the Getty Mansion. You know, he was a son of a judge who for some reason decided to give their little golden boy wonder to the Gettys for them to raise him up themselves. So he's had access to Gordon Getty's jet ever since, which he hmm. used a lot when he was mayor and stuff to check on his properties around Squaw Valley. And his contempt for people of lesser means is, you know, he wears it on his sleeve. 
can't get the smarmy grin off his face, even when he's talking about wildfires. He ran for mayor after Philip Burton died, Willie Brown, the most flamboyantly corrupt mayor since I've been here. Not the worst. That was Feinstein. But anyway, she was just mean and petty and loved police brutality. Well, I, I got an advance of the record before you guys dropped it. I've been listening to it like crazy. I really, really enjoy it. It kind of reminds me of the first record I heard from Guantanamo School of Medicine, The Audacity of Hope, and it just opened with it's such... It's Audacity of Hype. Or Audacity of Hype. It's, I just picture that fucking cover off the uh, Obama Hope poster, so I always say it wrong. I'm glad you connected the two, because not everybody does. But that's what I wanted to do, and because Shepard Ferry is a friend, I felt like uh, I needed to tell him ahead of time what was I, I was about to do to his yeah. art. And then, because he'd already done the cover for the No WTO Combo album, you know, the one during the Seattle protests, the live one with Chris Novoselic and Kim Files from Soundgarden and Gina Mainwall playing drums and stuff. Yeah. But he said, oh, who's going to do it? Oh, I don't know. I haven't decided yet. I want to do it. Okay, Shepard, game on. Awesome. Yeah, that's great. That's a still from a movie I was in called The Widower that's on the front cover. Oh, really? And Shepard changed a little bit here and there to get it right. He actually got me to go down to L.A., and so we both worked on it together in the end and get the back cover going. And then another person who works under him in that hive he has down there, because he does a lot of commercial projects, too. You know, the illustration on one side of the poster with the giant B instead of the Obama O. I mean, that guy was working on that at the same time in another part of the same room. Well, the Audacity of Hype audio played on their stereo. That's great, man. I, I just remember yeah, being blown yeah. away by that record and like the energy of it. And I think it was in the opening song where you had that observation of like, even if we wipe out Al Qaeda, what are their kids going to be like? You know, and that that's the shit that when we talk about like the ice border camps and oh, all the shit that we're doing, that like we're just planting the seeds for another 15, 20 years, maybe 10 years. I don't know for shit to get even uglier. Well, especially when millions upon millions of people that the Trump sea plague had, you know, destroyed their jobs and stuff. Yeah. A lot of those jobs are never coming back. Oh, absolutely. And the rage from that and how to feed everybody and keep people in their homes a lot better than the Obama Biden regime did when they just gave all the bailout money to the banks and then let people get foreclosed on and stuff. A lot of those foreclosure victims became Trumpsy voters. Yeah, that doesn't surprise and me at really, all. The really, really angry ones became actual Trumpsies. That's part of what's fueling that rage without a counter narrative being provided. I'm just hoping that the Bidenoid, the human coelacanth, if you know what a coelacanth is, it's a fish that looks like Biden. (laughs) And it was considered extinct millions of years ago until one came up in a net in the Indian Ocean. Oh, my God, the living fossil. And they're still really rare, but they see super mangy looking fish and with total Biden eyes and everything else kind of looks like his face too. And Biden is the human coelacanth. And I'm just hoping he's ancient enough that he grasps that, you know, he didn't go through the depression like my mom and dad did. He was born a little bit later, but that is the magnitude of what he's got to deal with. And every time he makes a public appearance and doesn't talk about the need to vote smart in the other offices and get the Senate back and keep the House and then on down to state legislatures and get the Tea Party crackpots out of the governor's mansions, how hard is he really trying? Yeah, I hear you. Maybe he's not supposed to be. You know, maybe we got to let people let off a little steam. Trump went too far. You know, we gave people Bill Clinton, we gave people Obama, but we basically, in terms of policy and trajectory towards the corporate coup, we've been handed one flavor of Reagan after another. Yeah. 
possibly even back to Jimmy Carter. He was the one who tilted the Democrats more corporate, more conservative. An exemplary former, but not a good president. Well, I've got to let you go. I really uh, appreciate your time. And again, I love the new record. It's It's got Thanks. so much energy. And again, it's still so poignant, even like you said, that it was yeah, I, written I, I don't a few do years old back. man punk, and I don't do trying to remake fresh fruit or plastic surgery disasters or any of the others. You know, this stuff just kind of comes out of me. And uh, as long as people behave the way they do... I'm never going to run out of ideas. And as long as I keep into cool music and keep having other things pop into my head that's mine that I can use, I'm not going to run out of songs. I've never been afraid to write other kinds of songs that might or might not appeal to the mosh pit. You know, keep it fresh, keep it real, keep it something I myself would like to not just listen to, but actually force myself to work out to. There's only so much of that around. <laughs> Yeah, it's dynamic. It's got twists and turns. It's everything that you would expect and then not. So, well done. Well, I... One thing that you wouldn't expect is that because of various mastering delays and other things, the vinyl and the CDs are not going to show up till early next year. Yeah, I've got my pre-order CDs for January. Might show up before Christmas, but the vinyl is going to take a while because of manufacturer turnaround time and trying to get the thing finally mastered and the lacquer cut and get that all right. Lots of ups and downs went on on this, and I had to get this thing out before the election. Yeah, definitely. You know, it's not a specific Trump album per se. He's only actually mentioned by name, but you know, for a couple lines in Satan's Comb Over, a line that was on the cutting room floor after some of the songs for the middle album, White People and the Damage Done. And, you know, I had Humpty Trumpty put up a wall clear back then and just never used it. You know, I have bags and bags of those things. And I wind up doing a lot of cut up and William Burroughs style construction of the lyrics in this day and age. Yeah. I even had to do that to make Man with the Dogs work way back when, which was one of the first Dead Kennedy songs. So I've always kind of had that as a tool here and there, especially on lard. But. The only other time Trump even appears in the song is we created Putin. Yeah. You know, which we basically did. And it just kind of infuriates me that not one goddamn punditoid or so-called thinker, writer, whatever, has pointed out that there, if we had had a Marshall Plan and went in and helped the people of the former Soviet Union like we did after we defeated Germany and Japan in World War II. And what do you know? No more Hitlers, no more Tojos. You know, after World War I, we left Germany in the lurch. And what do you get later? Hitler. What do we do when we abandon the Soviet Union? And this wasn't their fault. We got another one. We got Putin. We caused him my own theory, and I think it's pretty well founded, as to why Trump is so scared of crossing him. It's not a P tape. It's not worrying about a business deal to license his name to a hotel in Moscow. It's because after American banks completely cut Donald Trump off around the turn of our century, no more loans for you, you're a crook, you know, you never pay us back, you just declare bankruptcy, we're not giving you any more money. He goes to Deutsche Bank, that same dodgy German bank that was caught laundering money for Al-Qaeda and drug cartels and ISIS and whatnot, goes there, they loan him several hundred million, possibly over a billion that's coming out now. He never intended to pay them back, and he still hasn't, but they won't loan him any more money. Yeah. So then where does he go? Where do you think he goes? Well, even without seeing his tax returns, he was opening up more golf resorts right when banks wouldn't lend anybody money in 2009, 2008. Eric Trump, the biggest genius among his monster children, <laughs> is asked by a golfing magazine, well, here you are opening this stuff where are you getting your money? The banks aren't lending to anybody. How'd you get them to do it? And that toothy smile, like his mother's, gets flashed. Oh, 
we don't need American banks. We use Russian banks. Ah. The problem is you can't just pull a bankruptcy scam and not pay back the Russian mob. You don't get to be a bank in Russia unless you're mob. And who do you think runs the Russian mob <laughs> at this point? Yeah. The man also rumored to be the richest man in the world, even more than Jeff Beeswax. <laughs> also somebody who has proven again and again and again he has no qualms about poisoning people he doesn't like in other countries. Yeah. Which means Donald knows full well He's gorging cheeseburgers in bed at five in the morning, tweeting away. Putin could poison him. And poison Ivanka, too. <laughs> please don't poison me, please. No, no, no. Don't take Mar-a-Lago. Don't make it Putin Tower in New York, anything. But just don't poison me. Because that Lewis Wolf book, the first one, said that Trump is known for being hyper-paranoid of people poisoning his food. Really? Who do you think he's paranoid of? And that's why he likes to go get food from McDonald's and travel and stuff, is because they don't know they're making it for me. Yeah, it's true. On uh, that cheerful note, <laughs> yeah. please check out the download and get the hard copy of the album later. The artwork is worth it, believe me. You know, you can see the artwork on the site, the Winston collage that he forgot to put in his book. So I still was able to get it and stuff. And I wanted to use it for years of the brain inside the snake with the fangs mouth. I mean, it's going to be silver on black, nice. you know, and a little sticker that says, and it's tiny enough. You have to put the sleeve up close to your face. To look at it. Look here. This is your brain on Trump. Nice. And then you see your face reflected in the brain in the snake's <laughs> mouth. That's great, man. Yeah, I can't wait to get a hard copy in my hands. Yeah, me too. It's been very painful, but one of these days. All right, that is our show. Thank you guys so much for listening. Huge thanks to Jello for doing the show. And shout out to Anne Marie and Dominic at Alternative Tentacles. I think that's probably the least we've ever talked about songwriting on this show. But when you've got a career that's 40 years of classics since that first record, there's not enough time in the day. If you like the show, do me a favor, give us a five-star rating, subscribe to it. I'm going to close you out with a brand new song from Tea Party Revenge Porn. This is We Created Putin.
Crash for rocket pilot and chicken. No one went to jail. Clap, clap, press these two. 